Hello everyone, I'm Pastor Tommy McMurtry from Liberty Baptist Church. Want to make a video for you today on the subject of hell and did Jesus go to hell? I'm going full Ruckmanite today. I got my whiteboard and everything, stuff drawn out to kind of help uh, illustrate a few things. And this is a subject that I'm interested in. It's one that many people are very passionate about. And if you do not line up with the other person, they will quickly call you a heretic and a blasphemer and just all kinds of nasty names. It's very sad that when it comes to a lot of doctrinal things where I do think there's maybe room for some disagreement and uh, room for good discussion, that many people just immediately go on just attack mode and you can't even talk with people on these things. I'm not interested in people like that and I do not agree with that kind of behavior uh, on, uh, especially on a doctrine like this where there is not clear evidence to promote what many are teaching. And I'm gonna show you that today. And so when it comes to this subject of Jesus going to hell, uh, there really is no debate about whether or not he went to hell. Acts 2 uh, makes it very clear. You know, here's the uh, evidence on this side of Jesus going to hell. And I think Acts 2 is all that we need. now how we will define hell. That is where people might want to argue a little bit. And so let's go ahead and have a discussion about that because there's no getting around the fact that according to the Bible, Jesus did go to hell. It says in Acts 2, 24, whom God hath raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. We know it's talking about Jesus. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And that's from Psalms 16. And David's not talking about himself. We're going to see that. It says, Thou hast made known unto me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. So no one's going to argue with you that Jesus went to hell. What they will argue with you about is what does that mean? Now, I will tell you, my interpretation of this is that when Jesus was dead for three days, that he was where all the dead go who are lost. I do not believe that Jesus died the death of a saint and went to paradise, but I believe he died the death of a sinner and he went to hell. He did not die the death of a sinner because of his own sins, but because of my sins, because he was carrying our sins on the cross and he died the death of the sinner. That's what I believe. If you believe he went to paradise, you believe he died the death of a saint, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense seeing that he carried the weight of sin, uh, of sin in his body on the cross. So him dying the death of a saint doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but if you want to believe that, that's fine. Just uh, admit you believe he died the death of a saint. Uh, and so uh, some will concede again so that he went to hell, but there's no way he actually burned, but he actually went to paradise. This is what many people believe in, that there was hell in the heart of the earth. On one side you have hell, where the bad people went. On the other side you have paradise. And so, without a doubt, the Bible teaches Jesus descended into the lower parts of the earth. We're gonna see that. And so some will believe that Jesus descended to paradise, which causes many people to teach too that paradise got moved. They'll tell you the Bible teaches that paradise got moved from the heart of the earth up to heaven. Now, they can't show you a verse on that, they're assuming that because they are assuming Jesus descended to paradise. And I'm, gonna tell you, I'm just gonna tell you right now, uh, you've heard that before. If you believe uh, this in Abraham's bosom, you've probably said that, but you can't display in the scriptures where paradise was moved. 
It does not say that anywhere. You are assuming that. And that's a lot of this doctrine of Abraham's bosom is based on assumptions, based on false doctrine in certain areas. And so what a lot of people do when it comes to this subject is they will ask a misleading question as a way to nail you for being a heretic. And they will ask the question or they will accuse you of believing or teaching that Jesus went to hell to pay for our sins. And then what they'll do is they'll go, they'll do what is called the red herring fallacy, where it's like they try to distract from the real argument where I want to talk about what it meant when he was dead for three days. That's what I want to talk about. What did it mean when it said he was dead? Was he dead like a saint? You know, like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who, when Jesus was speaking to the Sadducees, said, you know, uh, he, uh, he mentioned how God told Moses, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So it referred to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as living, even though physically they were dead. So did Jesus die like them, or was he dead like a lost person? Because we know, too, Jesus also said that those who believe in him will never die. Now, obviously, that's referring to spiritual death, because we're all going to die physically if, uh, you know, we, uh, if the Lord tarries is coming. So I believe he died in every sense of the word. I believe he died like a sinner. I'd like to have a conversation about that. But what I, I usually have to deal with is people trying to distract and then going to all the verses where it talks about the cross. Where does it say anything about him going to hell? You know, and that's, that is misleading. That's what is known as a red herring fallacy. And I do not believe Jesus went to hell to pay for our sins. I believe that just like in the Old Testament, they would bring a lamb as an offering for sin. I believe that Jesus Christ and his body, that was the offering for sin. The Bible talks about how a body that was prepared for him. And Jesus Christ came to this earth, the son of God. He took on him the seed of Abraham. He had a real physical body, just like you and I do, one that hungered and thirsted and that it suffered pain. And Jesus went and he carried our sins on the cross and he fulfilled all things that were written in the, in the law and the prophets that he had to do. And after he finished all things, he went and he died. After he finished all things, he died and he was dead for three days. And so I, I, because I believe, and I want to have a conversation about what it meant to be dead, you know, what a lot of people do in order to avoid that conversation is they will just try to accuse me of teaching an offering that does not involve his body, an offering that does not involve the cross. No, I believe in the cross. I believe his body was the offering, but I believe he was dead. We all agree he was dead. Everyone agrees that after he, you know, after he did all things on the cross and said it is finished, we all agree he died. What does that mean? I think we ought to be able to have a conversation about that. And we don't need to go into these petty distractions uh, to try to just virtue signal how much more uh, of a cross supporter you are. Okay? I, we glory in the cross. And, uh, and for good reason. That's the only reason we're able to go to heaven. So this is a completely, it's a completely unfair question when people say, do you believe Jesus went to hell? to pay for sins. Now, I believe he paid for sins on the cross, but I believe that payment cost him his life and that he died. And so uh, I just want to show you what I believe on this subject, and then I'll let you decide for yourself because I'm not, I don't divide with people over this subject, but I am tired of the insults. I'm tired of the accusations. I'm tired of the accusations of blasphemy. Uh, I think that's completely unnecessary. And I think it's offensive that I'm expected to accept certain interpretations of certain scriptures and uh, and so we're going to we're going to talk about those things what people are asking me to accept in denial of a literal interpretation of this is completely unacceptable i can't do it so one of the things i want to do in this video is show how there is literally almost nothing to support this abraham's bosom doctrine while there's a couple verses that could potentially be indicators other very common proof texts without a doubt are not no one should be using these things so my position, I believe Jesus paid for the sins of all mankind on the cross. I believe his body was the sacrifice for sins. I believe that the, uh, 
I, I believe that just him suffering on the cross was enough. I believe he had to die. They couldn't take him almost to death. No, he had to die. And I believe he was in a state of death for three days. And I, I don't think that is heretical, anything about that. And so uh, I believe he was dead in every sense of the word. Hebrews 2.9 says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. I believe this death that Jesus tasted of, for me, since he tasted it for me, I will never have to taste that death. I'll taste physical death unless the rapture comes before I die. But I will never taste of the second death. I will never taste of hell. I won't spend one second in hell. John 8, 51, Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Okay? Now, again, I know a lot of saved people that have seen physical death. I know a lot of saved people that have gone to the grave, you know, that are buried in cemeteries. But, I don't know any saved people that have ever gone to hell, experienced that death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead. And the prophets, and thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. And obviously they did not understand what he was talking about. But it is very clear, Jesus, he tasted death for us. In Matthew um, 22, 31, I referred to this earlier. Jesus said, but as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. So I believe his time in hell was not him paying for our sins again. Listen, Jesus died once for all. Okay? And I, Jesus Paid, made one, he, one sacrifice and he came to earth one time. Everything that Jesus did, he had to fill, fulfill all things. There were things Jesus had to fulfill before he went to the cross. There are still some things that Jesus has to fulfill after the cross. And all the things that Jesus has done, he will never have to do again. He will never have to go to the cross again. He will never have to be born again. He will never have to be dead again. He will never have to resurrect Again, but all things have to be fulfilled. Death, burial, and resurrection, and those things were fulfilled. And so when Jesus was in a state of being dead for three days, that's not God saying, all right, now I'm going to give you another punishment. No. His punishment was that he died, and being dead is a bad thing. Being dead is a really bad thing, and he, he was dead for three days. So the truth is the burden of proof is on you to prove that his death was something different than the death of a sinner. And I don't think, I don't think you're able to do that. And so, um, what I, what, you know, so what I have written here on this whiteboard, and what I'm going to write, I'm going to write down the passages and arguments people use to debunk the literal interpretation of Acts 2.24 through 32. And so let's look at it, these arguments against Jesus going to hell. And the first one that will always come up is outrage. He did not go to hell and become a burnt sacrifice for us. That is a damnable doctrine. Preacher, you shouldn't be that stern. Yes, I should. They're talking about my Lord. And to suggest that he was in a place where the fire is not quenched, where the worm dieth not, where the rich man was, where he lifted his eyes in hell, being in torments. That is wrong. And as Brother Bradley said, the Bible says that Jesus told that man on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise, a place where there is gnashing of teeth and the fire is not quenched, is not paradise. Mm, I got a little passionate about that, but that's important. That is absolutely important. And you don't have to go far to hear that false doctrine being taught. And I will tell you, run from it like the plague. You run from it like you would a leper. You run from it like you would anybody that would do you harm. That is dangerous. It is damnable. And it is wrong. Outrage. Now, understand outrage is not an argument. Okay? Outrage... Righteous indignation, 
That's not an argument. But now, by all means, there's nothing wrong with you being outraged by false doctrine. There is false doctrine that outrages me. You preach work salvation, I'm outraged. You preach you can lose your salvation, I'm outraged. Okay, But my outrage doesn't prove anything. I can get up here and I can get angry and I can kick over this stand and I can smash this whiteboard and I can just throw a fit because I'm mad. I can't believe they're teaching this damnable heresy, but I haven't proved anything by that. I haven't proved anything. And you know what? There's, there's a time to get all fired up. But here's the thing. You, all, you should be capable of having an intelligent, coherent conversation when it comes to these things. And I feel like the outrage is just virtual signaling to distract from you know, the fact that you don't have a good argument. I think it's a form of intimidation that people are trying to use on their audience because who wants to be a heretic? Who wants to blaspheme Jesus or say anything negative about Jesus? Nobody wants to do that. But you know, a person who is confident in the scriptures, confident in what they believe, who believes they have truth, they're ready to engage. They're ready to show somebody where they're wrong. They're re ready to show somebody what the scriptures actually say. And I'm not saying you can't ever be outraged or that you shouldn't be outraged. I'm not even saying this doctrine that you're necessarily wrong to be outraged about it. Maybe you are right to be outraged about it, but just understand outrage proves nothing, but people always go to outrage when it comes to this subject. And I think it's just, it's because they are trying to bully people into going along with them and don't listen to those other guys. I think it's because of insecurity. That's my judgment on it. That's my opinion on that. But here's my question too, though. You know, what, you know why is it so offensive? Because people, they all say the same thing. You know, you're talking, you're saying that my Savior, Jesus Christ, that I love so much, you're saying that he went to hell. You know, that's so offensive. Well, why isn't it offensive that he was nailed to a cross? Why isn't it offensive that he was spit on and that he was mocked? Why are none of those things offensive? Why is hell so much worse? I, you, you see how that doesn't really make sense? But the truth is, we're not offended by the cross. We glory in the cross. You know, we do. We sing about the cross because we understand that our salvation came as a result of that. And so understand, you being offended that somebody would dare think that happened to your Savior that doesn't prove anything. Some really bad things happened to your Savior on the cross. Really bad things. The, the story of the crucifixion is a horrible story of for Jesus Christ, but it's a wonderful story for us because he was taking our punishment, and, and it's okay for us to celebrate that. Paul gloried in the cross. So your, your outrage and virtue signaling, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It's not consistent. And either way, it doesn't prove anything. But it's, it's a go-to every time, ladies and gentlemen. It's a go-to every time. And so the other argument is the Abraham's bosom doctrine. Um, and then to, to go into a little bit of maybe fine-tuning of where the difference is, we see that the rich man in, in the New Testament lifted up his eyes being in torments, and he saw Lazarus afar off in Abraham's bosom. There, he just wanted one touch of water. So we know that the hell for the rich man was hell. It was torments. And if you go look at the word that we see where the, the Old Testament saints went, um, it talks of David going to a place called Sheol, David going to a place of the grave. It talks about Jacob going there and Abraham. So we have a clear distinction of people that are listed as, as believers they go to a place that is the grave that has the word and same title that we would place on something else that is torments, but we know and understand that to be a holding place. I think that might help explain a little more of those different degrees there. And still clearly separate that a paradise, that a, that a grave holding place is not the same as hell where a torments is, where the rich man lifted up his eyes. Well, uh, in Luke 16, where we read about ex exactly what Brother Christian is talking about, uh, the Bible says in, the, in verse number 24, Luke 16, And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for now I am, for I am tormented in this flame. <clears throat> but Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thou 
thy good things, and likewise Lazarus, evil things. But now he is what? He's comforted. He's comforted. Now, Jesus went to where they were comforted, not a place where he was tormented in flames. Right? So I want you to remember that, and you can see that distinction. And there is verse number 26, as these men were talking about. Beside all this, between us, there is a great gulf fixed. So clearly, this is a separated place. These are not the same physical location. So the Abraham's bosom doctrine, that comes from mainly from Luke 16, and in verse 22, it says, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angel into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And so what people will tell you is that uh, Abraham's bosom is a place. It was a place in the heart of the earth. You know, that it was, it was paradise. And so when, that, when Lazarus died, he was carried down there where the rich man he was in hell over here. That, that's what they will tell you based on Luke 16. Now, I can kind of understand this picture from Luke 16, but we're going to show you that there's actually some other things in the Bible that shows that this is not necessarily how things have to be. But what about this Abraham's bosom? And I probably shouldn't have capitalized that B there because it's not capitalized in the Bible. This is not a name for a place. But yet people will tell you that it is. They won't display that from the scriptures, but they will just tell you that. And that's often what people do when they're teaching false doctrine, is they will read things that the Bible says, but then they will define it for you instead of letting the scripture define it for you. Now, I believe Abraham's bosom is literally just that, Abraham's bosom. And I'm going to show you that here in just a moment. And so notice how it says, and uh, in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. He sees Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. Is that a place? Or is it possible he's literally in Abraham's bosom, possibly being comforted with an embrace? Um, let's see. And he cried and said, Father Abraham. Now, is he calling out to a place or is he calling out to a person? You know, he, he's calling to a person. Just so happens to be the person he sees is the one that this place is named after. But no, he's not calling out to a place. He's calling out to a person. We all would agree with that. And he said, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. So, uh, in, so why is it calling, why did it refer to Abraham's bosom? Right here. But Abraham said, son, Remember thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Now how was the rich man tormented? He, the Bible already told us. In the flame. How was Lazarus being comforted? By not being in the flame? Or was he being comforted by what the scripture says, by being in Abraham's bosom? He's literally comforting somebody. I mean, the guy lived a rough life. He died a horrible death as a leper, but his suffering is over. He's now in paradise, and he is being greeted by Abraham with an embrace. And it's interesting, too, because, you know, God talks about how in the kingdom we're going to sit with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And these are, you know, you know, Abraham is such a central figure. And so I believe he's just literally in Abraham's bosom being comforted. It's Abraham's bosom, not, not the name of a place. But yet, everybody calls it Abraham's bosom. I'll say Jesus went to Abraham's bosom. Really, where in the Bible do we see Jesus being uh, uh, embraced and in the bosom of Abraham? Well, they're not, they're not claiming that. They're claiming a place. That's what they're doing. And they're claiming it's in the heart of the earth because without a doubt, too, his soul went to hell. And so they'll just say all of this would count as hell. And it all, we're going to go to Ephesians 4 in a little bit. It clearly says he descended into the lower parts of the earth. Where Jesus went was down. So they have to prove that paradise in Abraham's bosom, which is not the name of the place, but they've got to prove that that was down. So uh, Luke 16, 26, and beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. 
And so right there is that great golf that I, I drew there to kind of illustrate that. And I can understand where people kind of get the two compartments idea from this story, but understand this is not proof at all. This story is not proof of that picture right there. Because people, again, they will tell you paradise moved to heaven. They, they won't show a scripture. It's based on an assumption because we know that the Apostle Paul, he got caught up to paradise. We also know Jesus descended to the lower parts of the earth. So if Jesus descended to paradise, then yeah, it's true that it moved. But the Bible doesn't tell us that. You're assuming it moved based on the assumption Jesus descended to paradise. But this is not proof of that. The fact that they were, you know, that they're able to see each other from paradise and hell is not proof of that because in Revelation chapter 14, in verse 9, it says, The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark on his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And this isn't referring to the lake of fire because this is going to happen to people who take the mark of the beast. They will be tormented in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now, I don't, I'm not going to pretend to understand how everything in the spiritual realm works. But I can show you in the, in the New Testament, after the time when supposedly paradise moved, that they're still able to see each other. So the fact that they were able to see each other before doesn't prove that they, paradise is in the heart of the earth. They've always been able to see each other. And then people say, oh, I wouldn't enjoy heaven very much if I was able to see all the pain and sufferings going on there. Well, you know what? When you're like Christ, you'll be fine. Okay? And understand too, you know, there is going to be a time that's going to come where God's going to wipe away all tears from our eyes. And the thought of that, yeah, I hate the thought of that too. That's why I want to get as many people as I, saved as I can now. But understand, when we're like Christ, we will see sin the same way he does. Right now, I'm, I'm too sympathetic to sinners because I'm one myself. But that's, these things are not arguments. They are not proof of anything. And, you know, and so here's another question too. What scripture says that they weren't able to go to heaven before the cross? That, that, understand, that's also an assumption. You can't display anywhere in the scriptures where it says that they were not able to go to heaven before the cross. No, your system of theology has declared that to be true, but it's, that's not based on scripture. A lot of it's based on the idea of Abraham's bosom being in the heart of the earth. I mean, I mean what's it doing down there? Oh, you know what? I guess it's because they weren't able to go to heaven until Jesus died on the cross. But wait a minute. There's nothing that proves it was in the heart of the earth. You're assuming. These are all assumptions. And the truth is, I do believe they were able to go to heaven. And you say, well, you know, how, how could that be? Well, we're going to get into some of that in a little bit, but let me just without, try not to get ahead of myself. They got in on credit. They got in on the promise. Understand that the Bible talks about how Christ was a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And God was not up in heaven forbidding them to come into heaven in case he didn't come through on his promise. God always comes through on his promises. God called Abraham a father of many nations before he had any children. Paul referred to that and he said because God speaks of those things that be not as though they are. God, he is not up in heaven worried about whether or not he's going to come through on his promise. I get it. In our timeline, Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago, in roughly AD 30. But understand, the promise was there from the foundation of the world, and so access to heaven has always, it's always been around. And so uh, we'll probably go to, um, well, let's go ahead and go to some of those scriptures on that right now. How about Psalms 116, verse 15, where it says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Why was it so precious if they went to some place separate from God, you know, some place away from God. No, it was precious because uh, they were they able to be with the Lord. You know, if, if they weren't able to go to heaven without the blood, how did Enoch and Elijah go to heaven? Because everybody would agree that they went. 
Oh, yeah, well, well, they're the exceptions. Okay, well, what about Moses? Moses, we know he was standing on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus and Elijah. How do you get out of good hell before Jesus supposedly led captivity captive, which we're going to get to in just a minute? How, how did he get out of there? What was he doing on the Mount of Transfiguration? You know, when he was down in that, in that prison, how, how did he do that? You know what? Because Moses went to heaven too. So these, uh, there is no proof of these things. It says in Hebrews 4, 1, let us therefore fear lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into his rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. What are you going to do with that? Matthew 13, 35, that it might be fulfilled which is spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Now, I understand God revealed some things over time, but these things were always true from the foundation of the world. He said in Matthew 25, 34, then shall the king say unto them on the right hand, come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I thought Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. I thought it hadn't happened yet. Understand in our timeline on earth, it happened in AD 30. But in eternity, in eternity, these things have always been true. And you know what? I'm not going to pretend to understand eternity. I'm not going to pretend to understand the heavenly realm, but people who are teaching this nonsense, they will pretend that all of a sudden they do. And we'll, and we'll see more examples of how they do that here in a little bit. And so, uh, again, I don't know where people get this idea they couldn't go to heaven before the cross. I, that's just something inserted in there. I believe they got in, uh, to, you could say, on credit. And either way, you know, if you want to force heaven into Earth's timeline, uh, I don't know how you're going to do that. You know, you, I'm going to need to see some scripture on that. So, you know, those who are opposed to what I believe on this, they're going to have to, you know, they're going to have to teach Abraham's bosom, and they're going to have to do it in a way where they're going to try to show you something. They'll have to admit is just not spelled out in the Bible. It's a construct based on assu assumptions of certain things. But when we look in the Bible, we'll find out a lot of these assumptions are wrong. So what did Jesus do for the three days? Because we all agree he was dead for three days. Now, I believe he was dead, not like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I believe he was dead like a sinner. So now those who will disagree, they have a few places they like to go to show him doing something other than just being dead. Okay? And this is where uh, I start to feel like my intelligence is being insulted and, um, you know, and, but we're going to have to deal with these arguments and just, and people too, they have these arguments with great arrogance and it really is embarrassing. And so the next argument they use is the captivity captive argument. I think it was, wasn't it you that taught some time back in Sunday school about paradise and, 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 and Abraham's bosom slash paradise and the place of torment being they were both under the earth at the time, and there was a great gulf fixed. Remember that? The Bible says there's a great gulf fixed. Jesus was not on the torment side of that great gulf. The Bible says that He delivered captivity captive. That Those Old Testament saints, He presented Himself to as the object of their faith. Just like we look back to the cross, they looked forward to coming Messiah. Um, and basically, the, the teachings of Paul summarizes that when Jesus went to paradise, there he delivered captivity captive. That's a wordy phrase, and it's hard to understand when it just kind of sounds like some redundancy. But that is to say, he took those that were captive with him elsewhere. And then Paul further teaches that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so we know if Jesus ascended and went to sit on the right hand of the throne of God, he is there in heaven now. And he took those that were the Old Testament saints with him there. There's a different place that where they were at in the Old Testament paradise. Those now gone to heaven where we'll be when we are to, you know, maybe draw our last breath 
Or, as the Bible also teaches, we could be caught up in the rapture, and so shall we be with the Lord forevermore. There is no ending to that. There is no separation. So there's a distinction between an Old Testament paradise where those believers were held, were kept, were stored. We could say it like that. They were taken with Christ, who is the first one who resurrected there under his own power, took them with him. And there now we have the opportunity also, when we're absent from the body, we'll be present with the Lord. Our physical body may still be in the grave because we know that those that are, are in the grave, they'll be called up first, and those which are alive and remain will be called up afterwards. So, Remember earlier that I said Sheol or Hades was inescapable? Well, but Ephesians 4, 8 says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Many consider that this refers to the liberation of the souls of Old Testament saints who were freed from the confinement or prison in Sheol, Hades, Paradise, or Abraham's bosom. Captivity captive argument. So what they will tell you that means is that Jesus went down to Paradise, descended in the lower parts of the earth down to Abraham's bosom, and he got all those Old Testament saints and he took them captive and got them out of there. That's what they'll tell you that means. And they'll get that from Ephesians chapter 4. And folks, a little bit of study on this will show you that is an embarrassing interpretation of Ephesians chapter 4, but everybody uses the captivity captive argument. Okay, now, what I believe captivity captive means, and I, I'm not even going to say that, what captivity captive means, because this isn't even up for debate. It means you took what held others captive, captive, okay? The captivity was something very specific, and Jesus took that captive, okay? So what was this captivity that Jesus took captive, okay? It was, and I, I would think, since it's referred to in Ephesians, we could probably find the answer in Ephesians. And so we'll, let's start reading in verse uh, 8 of Ephesians 4, Wherefore, when he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it? But he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. This shows he didn't just go to the grave or the tomb, which his body did for sure, but his soul, it went and descended to the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. So, uh, what is that talking about? So, first off, what held us captive? Very clearly, it was the things of the law. That's what held us captive. Ephesians 1, we're not going to go through all of Ephesians, but this is a wonderful study that should excite any Christians. This is also something we often take for granted because we were never under the law. And it's a shame people aren't teaching on this very much, but if they did, it would probably mess up some of their pet doctrines like this. But Ephesians 1 shows how God had chosen before the foundation of the world to save both Jew and Gentile. He, Paul is showing how it was that God revealed through Paul that it was always God's intention to include Gentiles in his church and to be a part of the body of Christ. That's what Ephesians 1 is about. In Ephesians 2, he goes through and he talks about all the things that we used to be separated from. We used to be called uncircumcision by the circumcision. We used to be aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. We used to be strangers from the covenants and promises, but Jesus broke down that middle wall of partition. Jesus took those things out of the way. What things? The things of the law that excluded us. Jesus removed those things. The things that held us captive. Jesus removed those things. Ephesians 3, in verse 2, it says, If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, Lord, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. What's he talking about? You go read the law, and there is a ton of stuff in there that makes it impossible, not only for people like me to go to heaven, 
but even that excludes me from certain service of God because I'm not from Israel, because I'm not from the tribe of Levi. There's all these things that were against us, but Jesus took those things out of the way by the gospel, by his death, burial, and resurrection. And so then in chapter 4, he starts off telling these people who have been enabled not just to be saved, but to be servants of God. He says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. And guess what? We are capable of having a vocation as Gentiles, as sinners, because of what Jesus did for us, because Jesus led captivity captive. Jesus led captivity captive through his death, his death that he died. And not just that he ascended and went to the lower parts of the earth, but because he ascended, because he resurrected, now he is able to give gifts unto men. And that's what Ephesians 4 is, is all about. In Ephesians 4, 7, it says, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. He's able to do this because of grace. Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now let's leave out the parenthetical statement and notice what it says. What are those gifts? And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So how is God able to do all the, how is God able to make us able ministers? How is he able to give those gifts? He was able to do those things by the gospel, by his death, burial, and resurrection. He led captivity captive. He conquered the things of the law. And I love how Paul said it in Colossians 2. He's talking about the same thing. He says it much more briefly here. He says, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, that was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Folks, there is nothing in these passages showing that captivity captive is Jesus taking people out of good hell up to heaven. It's showing how he took the things of the law out of the way. He abolished those things in his flesh. He did all these things through his death, burial, and resurrection. And he was able to give us these gifts because he descended. He died. He descended to the lower parts of the earth, but he didn't stay down there. He rose from the dead, and from the issues of death came eternal life, came these gifts. And we are able to be ministers of Christ. I am able to be a minister of Christ to serve in his church because of what Jesus did. And you can go to the law and see all these things that would disqualify me from a lot of things, but the law, but because Jesus nailed those things to the cross, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And, you know, and so we're being exhorted, walk worthy of the vocation. And so we should make an attempt and do our best to live for the Lord and to try to be, try to be worthy and not take advantage of the grace of God. That's what that's about. And to think that People are taking that doctrinally rich passage about Jesus removing those things of the law that were against us, and it's him taking saints out of good hell up to heaven. That's pretty bad. But yet, that is an argument that everyone uses, and it's a really, really bad argument. So another argument is the spirits in prison argument. But if we continue on... We're, giving, we're given more information on where Jesus was and what he was doing between the cross and the resurrection. 1 Peter 3.19 says, By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. The word prison in the Greek is the word phylike, a prison, hence the place of confinement of the spirits of the dead. The spirits in prison argument. Now this, this is another really bad argument argument. Now, I will admit that 1 Peter 3, you know, it is, it can be a confusing passage. I'll, I'll admit that. I'm not real mad at people for this, but what, what I am bothered by is because it's not clearly saying what they're saying, it says, and it's obvious that they just need more scriptures to back up what they're teaching right here. And they're just, Luke 16 is not enough for all the things they're claiming because there are other possibilities to describe certain things based on stuff that we read in the book of Revelation. So they, they need more. They need 
to show Jesus doing something other than just being dead and in hell for three days. They got to have a reason. So they came up with the captivity captive argument. And where that originated from is another conversation for another day that I'm not going to get into because we just want to keep it about the Bible. But that is, folks, that's not an argument. That's gone. Okay. That is an outrageously foolish interpretation. And everybody does it because they're parroting each other. They heard somebody else use it. But the Spirit's in prison. This also is not an argument. It says in 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the Spirit's in prison. Now, they will tell you, that happened down here. And now, understand, there's a lot of interpretations for this. Okay? There's a lot of interpretations. Uh, I'm not going to, uh, you know, necessarily try to hold everybody that believes a certain way to a certain interpretation. But uh, there's, there's a lot of ways people do this because if you go to chapter 4 in verse 6 too, it says, For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead. So it's like, okay, and, I, and I've heard people say, well, yeah, he preached to the spirits in prison. That's those in paradise or good hell. But th then he also preached to the dead. That's those over here in hell. So here's a question. Was the dead those over here in hell or those over here in paradise? It's clear the spirits in prison and the dead are two different groups. So who are they? Now, I'm going to tell you who they are. I'm not going to take the time to prove this from the scriptures, even though it can be, but we'd have to go through all of 1 Peter. I will leave a link in the description of a sermon I preached uh, from 1 Peter 3 where I explain this, exactly what this means, and I, and I prove what it is. But let me just tell you, the spirits, and because here, here's the thing. It says, he preached also to the dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. Well, these people that are in hell definitely can't live according to God in the Spirit. Why would he preach something to them that was impossible for them to do? And why would these people, how can these people live according to God in the Spirit when they're already dead? So that doesn't make any sense. Him preaching to the spirits in prison had nothing to do with when he was dead for three days and three nights. It has nothing to do with any preaching that took, down, uh, that took place in the heart of the earth. No, the spirits in prison are referring to those who are under the law. It's a reference to him preaching to the Jews who are in bondage. And Jesus came and he preached deliverance to the captives. They were, the law was bondage for them. And there's a lot of scriptures to back that up. And then the dead is a reference to the Gentiles. You see, the Jews, while they weren't all saved, they ha God had done a work in their nation. They were God's people. They had the oracles of God. Not all of them were saved but they were in bondage because of the law, where the Gentiles, they weren't even seeking for righteousness. They were just walking according to the lust of their flesh, according to the course of the world, where you know the Jews at least had some form of mor uh, morality. Uh, they had certain things that were biblical that they did, that they practiced, but the Gentiles, they were the dead. And the spirits in prison were those who were under the law or the Jews. And so uh, if you have any questions about that, Go watch that message. So, but understand, nothing in that passage clearly indicates anything here. In fact, it, it can't mean that. It absolutely cannot be about Jesus preaching while he was dead for three days. Jesus, there is nobody Jesus could have preached to in the heart of the earth on how to live according to God in the Spirit. So that is a horrible argument, and yet everybody goes to that. Everybody goes to that argument. And then the next argument, everyone goes to, this is usually probably one of the first arguments that they go to, is the it is finished argument. Some while back, I preached a message on a Sunday morning, it is finished. Jesus said it is finished on the cross. Not it is almost finished. Not phase one is finished. It is finished. What does that word mean? In Gre the Greek word is tetelestai, and it means paid in full. God poured out His righteous wrath on His Son on the cross. And when Jesus bowed His head and gave up the ghost, it was finished. I think that wraps it pretty much 
completely up um, just to, to note that <clears throat> the severity of believing that Christ's work at cross wasn't sufficient is, is, is another gospel. And the Bible says to him that teaches another gospel, let him be accursed. And, and I think that's another gospel because it's not finished at Calvary. It is finished. And if you think after Jesus suffered on the cross, he also died and suffered in hell, you're saying it wasn't finished. You're saying God's wrath wasn't satisfied. You're saying you're claiming all these horrible, blasphemous things. And then this is typically too where they uh, like to show more outraged. And I think probably because this is probably the worst argument that they have. The it is finished argument. They're always going to use a lot of outrage because it's a it's not an argument. Okay? It's absolutely not an argument. And so they'll go to John 19:30 when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar. He said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. And it's interesting that it mentions that after he uh, received the vinegar. Because he said, I thirst, and the Bible tells us, because he had to fulfill all things that were written by the prophets. He had to fulfill all the prophecies. All prophecies matter, including thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. They all matter. And so after Jesus finished doing everything he had to do on the cross, he said, it is finished, and he gave up the ghost. But understand, that's not the only time he said it is finished. In John 17, 4, he said, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Well, why is he saying it is finished when he hasn't even gone to the cross yet? Because there were also things he had to do before he went to the cross. He had to be baptized. He had to be tempted the devil for 40 days. He had to preach in Galilee. You know, he had to heal the sick and give sight to the blind. He had to do all these things that the prophets said he had to do. And there were several times where people wanted to kill him, but it was not his time. But once Jesus got to where he had fulfilled all the things that were, uh, that were prophesied in the scriptures, it was finally time for the cross. And then when the soldiers came, he allowed them to take him and he laid down his life and he went and did everything that he was supposed to do in his body on the cross and understand when Jesus said it is finished. Yes, that was a reference to everything he had to do in this life, in his body, but everyone will agree after he said it is finished, he died. Everyone agreed, will agree, that he had to rise from the dead three days later. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us a bunch of things that Jesus still has to do. Okay, so the thing is, the it is finished, it was talking about something specific. It was talking about the payment for sins in his body on the cross. But Jesus still had to be dead for three days to fulfill the scriptures. And just because while he was dead, he's in hell, it's not that, it, that's a foolish thing to say that it's teaching something happened again. No, Jesus only died once, but that death did last for three days. And so to just to teach that, you know, God's pouring his wrath out on him again. No, God poured his, you know, God's wrath was satisfied on the cross, you could say, but then he, when he died, but he stayed in that state of death for three days. And again, I think we can have a conversation about what that means. But to, to claim that that's just this damnable heresy or blasphemy, when your only solution is this doctrine here that really has no weight, where you are teaching all kinds of foolish doctrines, outrage isn't really an argument. It is finished, not really an argument. Spirits in prison, captivity kept, definitely not an argument. Abraham's bosom, it's theoretical. It's a possibility, assuming you're right about all these other things, but that's not clearly spelled out in the Bible. And it's definitely not called Abraham's bosom because that's literally just Lazarus being comforted and embraced and literally being in Abraham's bosom. I take that passage literally, that it's, he's in Abraham's bosom. You change it to be a place, and that's wrong. So uh, these are not arguments. So... Uh, what, the next argument, and the, the last one, or well, second to last one I want to look at, and I'm going to say that this is probably their best argument, okay? This is probably their best argument, and, this, and, and again, I can understand where people get confused and something. This is why I don't get too mad at people, but uh, what Jesus said to the thief on the cross, thief on the cross, 
Well, for one, we know what the the thief on the cross got told. He didn't say, I'll see you in hell today. He said, I'll, I'll be with you in paradise. And he didn't say, well, in three days I'll meet you in paradise. He said, no, I'll be with you in paradise today. So we know that. I mean, he went to paradise. He didn't go to hell. But What did Jesus say to him today? Thou shalt be with me in paradise. And so obviously when Jesus, you know, died or, you know, the thief wouldn't have gone to hell. So what do we do with that? All right. What, what do we do with that? Well, here's the thing about that. Okay. Again, this alone. Okay. First off, it is finished. Not an argument. Spirits in prison. Not an argument. You're just wrong. Captivity captive. Not an argument. Just wrong. Outrage. Not an argument. It's just virtue signaling. Abraham's bosom. Theoretical, you know, and, but not spelled out. Okay. Theore theoretical, mainly assuming all these other things are right. Now, can we get from what Jesus said about the thief on the cross that now all of a sudden this is true and it makes your misuse of these passages true? No, it doesn't. So again, assuming, all right, assuming that I am 100% right and that thief went straight to heaven, what, what am I going to do with that? And I don't, because I don't think this is really a problem because we see this type of thing a lot in the Bible. Got to understand that Jesus Christ is a member of the Trinity. And, uh, and so when he said in John 14, 18, okay, it's, it's funny the verses we all want to go ultra literal on, the way we pick and choose these things. But in John 14, 18, Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So wait a minute, if the comforter, when he came, that was Jesus coming to him, why are we waiting for the return of Christ? Okay, no, we all, we, we all want, agree we're looking for the physical, literal return of Jesus Christ. But Jesus did come at Pentecost, but he came through the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, I will come to you. But we know he was talking about the Holy Spirit. Jesus did say in John 10, 30, I and my Father are one. Jesus did say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So if that thief goes to heaven and he's with the Father, is it out of the character of Christ for him to say that you'll be with me? It obviously is not. It says in Colossians 2, 9, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus is capable and Jesus does in the Bible often speak on behalf of God the Father and God the Holy Ghost. He does that more than once. And so, why couldn't he have done that with the thief on the cross? Okay, the thief on the cross thing does not all of a sudden make all of this a possibility or a reality. Because, again, you're not displaying this anywhere. This is based on the assumption that when Jesus said that, that he was not speaking on behalf of the Godhead, that he was only speaking on behalf of the Son of God, and he doesn't have to be doing that. You're, you're, you'll claim that. So another thing, too, that we can look at when it comes to this is, you know, are we sure that we understand how time works in heaven? Are we sure we understand how time works in eternity? You know, th this is something we can talk about. This is another interesting concept an interesting subject. I mean, the Bible does say in 2 Peter 3, 8, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. And so uh, when, you know, that thief said, remember me when thou comest in thy kingdom. And he said, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And I believe that that thief went straight up to heaven, not down into Abraham's bosom. You know, let me ask you this question. And that is, you know, how much time has passed for the thief in heaven now? Okay, we obviously understand too, Jesus didn't actually go to heaven for another 43 days after that. Was the thief went up there like, hey, I've been waiting for you for 43 days. You said you were going to be with me today. Or was it for him that day anyway? Again, we don't know how time works in heaven exactly, but we do see in John 20, verse 16, Jesus saith unto her, Mary, she turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren, say unto them, I ascend to my Father, and your Father, and to my God, and your God. 
So when Jesus came out of the tomb, he had not yet ascended to the Father. So what happened to all those people that he led out of good help? Did he just get them out of hell and then the angels took them the rest of the way? I mean, I guess that's a possibility. You know, but at the same time, that's not spelled out in the scripture. It's a you, know, it, it, you could say it's a possibility. But Jesus had not ascended to the Father yet. And how come Mary can't touch him? Because he hasn't ascended to the Father yet. I thought it was finished at the cross. You know, so why is he worried about her possibly defiling him or something like that? I thought it was finished at the cross. Again, there's still things left to do. So, you know, how much time has passed in heaven since then? Uh, you know, we don't know. Eternity is not like it is here on this earth. I don't understand how it all works exactly, but it is definitely something we could ponder and speculate on. But people, what's funny when you do this, I mean, they will scoff. They will use outrage that you would invoke the Trinity in this situation, even though we see other places in the Bible where Jesus speaks on behalf of the Trinity where the Bible says, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And so if that thief is going to go up to heaven and be with the Father, he's with Christ. That is, that is not a stretch. That fits our theology as Trinitarians absolutely fine and perfect. So uh, these, are, these are all bad. Art. That, so that one, I understand where people are coming from on that. But just that passage right there does not create this whole new reality over here. It, that, that does not work. So then the last argument we'll look at, we're not going to take time to go through the scriptures and all these things, but what people will do is they will say, well, you've got to understand the Greek. Number one, what about Acts 2, 22 through 31? And then number two, the King James Bible does not distinguish between Gehenna and Hades. It just says hell, and hell, according to one commenter, is always a place of suffering. Words for hell. And the King James translators, they always use the word hell, but sometimes it's talking about Hades, which can encompass all of this, the bad part and the good part, you know, or sometimes it's just talking about the grave. And so when it says, I'll not leave my soul in hell, that's just referring to his body being in the grave. But here's the thing about that too, and, and I've had some insist that, no, that's only talking about his body in the grave. But understand, you know, his body in the grave, that is a, a big part of things because it was prophesied that his, his, that holy one, his flesh would not see corruption. And that body, that sacrifice for sins, it did rise from the dead and it stands before the Father today. The offering for our sin stands before God making intercession for us, still there with the holes in his hand. And so, I mean, you know, without a doubt, there are references to the grave that literally is talking about the tomb. But the Bible also tells us that he descended to the lower parts of the earth. And Acts 2 also says that Jesus was loosed from the pains of death. Because again, death is a bad thing. When, you, when your body dies, it's not over for you. Okay? And if you're lost, yes, you are in pain. You're in torment, like the rich man. And so I don't understand how paradise can be the pains of death. That doesn't make any sense at all. But, but that, what they'll do, they'll use those Greek words and then they will define those words for you instead of letting the Bible define those things. And guess what? 100% of the uses of the word hell in the Bible are negative. All of them. It's always negative. It's always a bad place including in Acts chapter 2. It's always a bad place. There's not one positive reference to hell as like being par actually paradise or some good thing. It's not there. What you need to do, in, in fact, it's easy to figure out which Greek word was used um, in the King James for uh, where it uses hell just based on the context because hell involves torment, involves fire, you know, it is a prison. And so there's a hell involves a lot of different things. And so sometimes those Greek words, you know, that we see where they're different, uh, it's because they're referring to different aspects of hell. But the thing is, we can figure out what those aspects were by the context of the passage. And so if we actually go to all the uses of the word hell in the Bible, and we let the Bible define the, how that word is used, then everything becomes crystal clear. But what they want to do is they want to show you how Sheol sometimes is referring to the grave, literally meaning, you know, 
where you put a body. But again, sometimes too, it is referring to the realm of the dead. And so what they do is they'll just take that definition and then use it however they need it to and ignore the context of the passage. And all the uses of hell are negative. And so there is no reason for me when I'm reading Acts 2 to get a, you know, a positive feeling that Jesus is in some good place where God loosed him from the pains. Uh, that doesn't make any sense at all. So understand that that is, that is a distraction. That is them going outside the Bible to define a word, and we don't need to do that. Everything that you need to know about the use of that word can be found in the context of that passage. And going back to the Greek does not give you any deeper meaning. All it does is it gives these guys an opportunity to go and give definitions of those words that actually fit more of a Greek mythology that teaches something like this. And they try to make it fit with the Bible, but I've already displayed what they're explaining here. It is not, uh, it is not clearly laid out in scriptures. So I'm here today to just show you, I believe that Jesus paid for our sins on the cross and that he died. And I believe that Jesus was dead for three days. I believe that that death, you know, him being dead was painful and God had to loose him from it. It was painful because he was in hell, because he died the death, not of a saint, he died the death of a sinner. He tasted a death that you and I will never have to taste. And, and we'll all taste a physical death if the Lord tarries his coming. And so for someone to call me a heretic, to accuse me of blasphemy because of something like that, I think that's over the top, I think that's outrageous, and I think that is a, a sign of insecurity in your own doctrine. And, and until you repent of your use of the spirits in prison argument, the captivity captive argument, you know, the it is finished argument. So if you want to build that all around the thief on the cross, I won't hate you for it, but you can't expect me to go along with that. I don't, I don't think that's fair and uh, I think it's, um, I think it's, frankly, it's kind of childish and people just need to get over themselves, get over your pride. And most people that watch this video, they have, they've said so much, they've been so harsh towards people who are different than them on this, they won't even repent of their captivity, captive usage, or their spirits in prison usage. And I'll leave links to sermons I've done on both of these that leave no doubt uh, what those passages are are talking about and you're literally pulling something that the authors never intended. So I hope this was a help and a blessing to you. Thank you so much for watching. Please like this video and share it with as many people as you can. So God bless you.